want us to look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1. NIV, please. Quickly, I want us to talk about the culture of worship. The culture of worship. Um, initially, we I thought we were going to be concluding the mystery of helpers. But there's something about worship that I feel like the I could sense that the Spirit of God wants us to talk about and wants to reveal. If I ask you this question, what is worship? What would be your answer? To you. Is there anyone here that has the, you would like to tell us what worship is? You know. Sound, can we have the mic? I can give them my mic. Worship. What is worship? Is there anybody that would like us to tell us what worship is? You see, worship actually accounts for a huge percentage of our work with God. To be quite frank, if you ask me, in my opinion, it should be 90% of our interaction with God. All right? So can somebody quickly tell us, what do you know as worship? What is worship? Anybody? Believers? Anybody would like to tell us what worship is? Anybody? Okay. We're here to the rescue. Lord. Hallelujah. For me, worship is an art of gratitude. And it's a place where I found find rest and peace. And I've come to grow in the knowledge that if I don't play worship all day, like there's something missing. Me personally. And I I I know I relate with God better when I worship him. Okay. So to her, worship sound, please help me. To her, worship is The song, right? Have we quickly looked at Romans 12, 1? It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as what? This is good. They are not with me, so let's try. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as what? Holy and pleasing to God. This is your what? So, what is worship? Yes, ma'am. Hallelujah. Worship is to love God, uh, loving, to love what God loves and to hate what God hates. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Please put your hands together for her. If you actually want to clap, please clap. I mean, She said, worship is loving what God loves and hating what God hates, right? Now, let's look at this scripture again. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, which means that God has shown you mercy. The only reason why you're here is because God has shown you mercy. How? We see from scripture, through the divine providence of that sacrifice at the cross of Calvary, you have been shown mercy. Yes or no? So, he says that in view of God's mercy, you are to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship, which means that the way we live our lives, the way that we carry ourselves, is actually worship. Do you understand? Of course, there are different and diverse kinds of worship. Many of us have come into the Christian race 
or journey, seeing worship as an event or a specific act. Many of us have seen worship as slow songs. You understand? And so sometimes you hear people say, let's be in the mood of... So when you were not in the mood of worship, what mood were you in? Hello? I say this pastor, I've come again. When you were... We say, let's be in the what? In the mood of worship. So before that mood, what were we? What mood were we in? In the mood of violence? Okay, in the mood of war and, and, and vengeance. So worship is not a mood. Hello? Are you getting what I'm saying? So the first thing you understand about worship is that worship is not necessarily an event. Neither is it offering songs to God. That's not the entirety of worship. Are you with me? Are you with me? So it says that this is your spiritual act of worship. So if it says you should offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which means that whatever we do that pleases God is worship. So worship is an offering because you use the word offer. What is an offering? An offering is something that you offer. Yes or no? So he says that you should offer. Now let me tell you this. We will come to, by God's grace, we will come to the aspect where we talk about the diverse types of worship. And we will talk about um, worship, congregational worship or co corporate worship. But you find that a few minutes ago we were worshiping. Everybody, most people were standing and they were just trying to connect with the unseen God. But there were some other people who, this is not what I came here for. So you just sit and you are looking. That's because you, you don't understand. You are a sincere person. God loves you and you love God, but you don't understand. When we, when we close our eyes during worship and we lift up our hands, and, and what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? You, you, you know that, we read a scripture before. If, if you just fell from heaven, right? Maybe not from heaven, from anywhere. You just appeared on earth. And you saw somebody just lifting up their hands and just doing like this and singing songs. You came from Pluto or, or Mars. And you look at them. Don't they look like they are crazy? Huh? Talk to me now. Does it look normal? Does it look normal? And so, so somebody finds it as an abnormal thing to do. And then some people now go the extra mile. You see them crying. You know, like, Who they beat you now? And they need all. So some people don't understand these things. They don't understand. Before your song can make sense, your life would have to make sense first. Do you understand? Because your first object, the, the first offering that you bring to God is actually your life, not necessarily your song. What are songs? Songs are vehicles that convey our worship. Do you understand? So it's not the song that is the worship. The song helps you to articulate your worship. So there are things that you want to tell God and then ah, just, just saying it as mere words is not sufficient. So you want to convey those words to him. So worship is not singing is part of worship, but it's not, it's not all there is to worship. But we'll come to that part of singing. There is a prayer that's also prayer of worship. Do you understand? Praise God. I want us to look at John chapter 4, verse 23 to 24. If you have the NLT version, 
I will be so happy. Uh huh. Can we read one, two, three, go? But the time is coming indeed. It's here now. When true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, the Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. So which means that God has a need. God has a desire. He says that the time is coming. Indeed, the time is here when true worshippers. So if we have true worshippers, it means we also have false worshippers. Yes or no? Yes or no? And so it goes further to explain what it takes or what it means by saying a person is a true worshipper. Which means that for you to say a person is a true worshipper, the person must worship him in what? In spirit and in truth. So what does it mean to worship God in spirit and in truth? This question is not clicking. What does it mean to worship God in spirit and in truth? How many of you worship God here in spirit and in truth? Okay, so can you explain to me what you do? When you say you're worshiping God in spirit and in truth, what is it that you do? You see that there are many people who worship God, but according to God's desire, it's a reflection and it's exposing the fact that not everybody who have come to worship him are actually worshiping him. Complete act of worship is one who is a worship that, you know, many of you have seen that thing online. It's in a collabo. There has to be a collabo between the worshiper and the worship. The fact that you worshipped him with all your heart does not mean that it will be received. There's some people that will not talk about here. The one that said today worship, I don't even enjoy him. It was not you you were worshipping. Thank you very much for not enjoying the worship because it wasn't offered to you. But you see, I'm talking about the act of offering the worship. God can, beyond the songs that you sing, make sure that the container is right. If not, it cannot, it cannot, it, it, you know, it's supposed to go up like a sweet smelling aroma, right? So, so when it's going up, it, the aroma is being, is mixed up with other things. Have you seen a person with a conch body odor that sprays perfume? Then it mixes together. And then they pass you, tears start to drop from your eyes. Praise God. So it says that, can we have that scripture? Scripture, sir. Yes. It said the Father is looking for those who worship. So right now, as we are seated here, guess what? The Father is looking for those who worship him in spirit and in truth. To worship God in spirit simply means that you understand, because it started by saying that God is a spirit. You understand that he is a spirit, and it takes spirit, spirit worship, for a spirit to receive it. And so your, your, your worship must not be in the flesh. It must not be in the flesh. It must be sincere and spiritual. When it says, and in truth, it means that it must be within the confines of scripture. There are certain worship songs that are not scriptural. Praise God. Praise God. There are certain worship songs that are not what? Scriptural. So if it is not scriptural, God is not receiving that worship. Are you following? So when we talk about a culture of worship, what is culture? Culture, culture is the behavior, beliefs, and values of a particular group or society. It is the behavior, beliefs, and values of a particular group or society. For Christians, worship should be central to our culture, shaping how we live, think, and act. Can 
Bible talk about the heart posture in worship? The heart posture in worship. There is a particular posture that your heart should be in when you worship God. Now, I'm not talking about whether you are kneeling or standing. You can be standing, but you are kneeling. You can be kneeling, but you are standing and rolling your eyes. Do you understand? You see, one thing that makes God very interesting is as much as your act is important, but he can see beyond your act. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? For example, if you were to show me honor, right, you will do certain things that I can interpret from what I see as honor. But you see, with God, he looks beyond those acts. He looks at the heart. So the heart, the heart of the individual must be in sync with the act. If not, it's a failed enterprise. You're wasting your time. Praise God. And so let's look at the heart position of worship. Number one, worship requires humility. Worship requires humility. Isaiah 29, verse 13. Worship does not begin with the keyboard. Neither does it begin with the song. It begins from the heart. When a man's heart is not right, it's impossible for him to offer true, sincere worship. Are you following what I'm saying? And so the Lord says, these people say they are mine. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are what? Their hearts are what? So as you are offering words from your lip to God, guess what? He's also checking beyond your words. He's checking your heart. And so he says that I don't have a problem with what's coming out from their mouth. The worship is beautiful. But you see, their heart is far from me. And their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules. Lend. See, let me tell you this. One of the most important tools in your interaction with God is your heart. It's, it's actually the most important tool. Because you see, when a man's heart is not right, everything else starts to fall apart. Praise God. I pray we get to the part where we'll talk about specific actions. If not, maybe another time. Number two. Let me give you this scripture. Before we go to number two. Psalm 51 verse 17. Psalm 51 verse 17. It says that the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. Which means when you come with your worship, let's assume. Now, now, by the way, by the way, I'm not talking about perfection here. Because somebody may be thinking, ah, that means I'm not to worship God now because of what I did yesterday. No, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about here is the posture of your heart. So it is true that you have done what you have done. But is your heart having a posture of repentance? So it says here that the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. That the sacrifice that God desires is a broken spirit. Please, can we have NKJV so that, you know, we can understand properly. NKJV, NKJV. Yes, the sacrifices of God are what? Are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, oh God, you will not despise. So which means that even when a person comes before God guilty of sin and um, disobedience, the person can only have access or can only attract his attention if the person is coming with a broken spirit, a contrite heart. Do you understand what I'm saying? A repentant heart. Some of you are too strong. Your heart is like the more that they have dried. God is finding it hard to relate with you because your heart is too strong. He cannot break you. Your heart is too strong. But he's soft though, to that boy. But you see, he's strong towards God. You can cry if you say, I'm not doing it again. But to God, you will sit comfortably. Everybody, let the heaven fall down. Let everybody be rolling on the floor. But your heart is like, is like rock of ages. It cannot bend. It's like poor price. Rigid like this. 
Hello? Tell your neighbor, have, have a tender heart towards God. <laughs> One of the things that God liked about David was because of his heart. David was not a perfect man. David was a songwriter. But you see, even in his writings of his songs, David, David, David conveyed his posture as one who is insufficient in himself. If God does not help him, he would... See, let me tell you, any man unassisted by God is a disaster waiting to happen. Do you understand? We have all been helped by God. So when you come before God, humble yourself. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Number two, heart posture. Worship with obedience. True worship is accompanied by obedience to God's commands. Obedience. Now, there are some people, eh? I can say, let's rise on our feet now. Some people will still sit down. And I don't understand why. Some of us have trained ourselves to disobey by default. Like, you don't even know that you are disobeying. It just happens. Like, like they say, you know they grieve for anybody. That's just how you operate. Let me tell you, it is dangerous because there, at some point in time, you will need to follow instructions to save your life. But when you have trained yourself to disobey by default, what happens is that at the time that you need to obey, that your life will depend on it, guess what happens? Ah. Your worship must be garnished with obedience. Obedience in and outside of church. Praise God. Praise God. Hmm. Let's look at some practical steps to cultivate a culture of worship. Number one, daily personal devotion. Daily personal devotion. Let me tell you this. There are some people who are here today, or let me rephrase, the people who will get the most out of a service like this are people who have taken out time to spend with the Lord, even in preparation for the service. There are some people, they just wake up on Sunday morning and they look at their time, okay, ah, now, now, now prayer they do, mama she first. Then you relax and you look at time. Okay, uh, it will take me 20 minutes. Okay, let me just relax first. At least it's going close to message time. You know, before you now, before you now go. <laughs> the people who get the most out of a service or a corporate meeting with God are those who have prepared their hearts. Because you see, do you know one of the reasons why, I hope you know that it's not, it's not in the Bible that when you have the order of service, Praise and worship must come first. You know, when I say praise and worship, I'm talking about songs must come first. Do you know why it's like that? Because a lot of people have not prepared their hearts. Normally, in those days, it wasn't necessarily stated in the, in the specific order how the service should go. But sometimes we have to even do an elongated period of worship so that we can, we can get you to, to unpack your soul. Because at that state that you are, it's difficult for you to make sense of spiritual things. Are you getting what I'm saying? But so, you see, the, the, the positive effect of having a personal devotion time is that you are in a constant awareness of the presence of God. You are in a constant um, setting, soul setting that allows you to tap into God without having to do many, many celebrity things, you know, many, many fizzy things. Do you get what I'm saying? Yes. So, it's important that you maintain a daily personal devotion time with God. Praise God. 
Number two, practical steps to cultivate a culture of worship. Worship through service. Worship through service. What we mean by this is worship through offering. You see, if you are in, if you are a worker here, understand that you are not here to do pastor a favor. Neither are you here to do me a favor or to do the church a favor. It is your service to God. That is your your private worship to God, of which not everybody has the privilege to do it. Do you get what I'm saying? Some people, they have no, they, they've not even thought about it. Say, being a worker in church, it doesn't even cross their mind. But God has granted you the capacity and grace to do it. But you see, worshiping or service in God's vineyard to God, even outside the church, is worship unto God. It may trust you to know that even offering help to people is worship to God. Why? Because it is in obedience to God. Remember when we talk about obedience, it's in obedience to the instruction of God, to what God has asked us to do. Are you following me? Another practical step to cultivating a culture of worship is living a life of gratitude. Living a life of gratitude. Living a life of gratitude. Thanksgiving is not an event that we do once in a year or twice in a year. To be quite frank, I'll tell you this. We have too many ungrateful Christians. Too many. We are so entitled. Like, we believe, sometimes you hear people give testimony and say, no, I know that I'm a child of God, so this cannot happen to me. So I said, this cannot happen to me. No, you are right, oh. It's not as if you are wrong. But, you see, it is by God's grace and mercy that you are not consumed. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yes. Stop feeling entitled. That's why we don't thank him. Jesus healed the lepers. He told them, go and show, go and show yourself to the priest. He healed them, and only one came back, and he asked him, where are the nine? Do you know why the nine did not come back? Because now Jesus now, he's supposed to hear me. If you know him, you are. He's supposed to hear me. I read a scripture a few days ago about the man. Ah, I wish we can look at that scripture. Can you help me find that scripture of the man who was paralyzed for 37 years, and he was waiting for the water to be stirred? Look for that scripture for me quickly. I want to show you the attitude that some of us have. We, we, feel, we feel entitled. Uh, uh, now, there is, now there is in Jerusalem by the ship gate, there by the ship gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda. 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 Having five porches. <laughs> Sometimes, eh? I wonder what, anyway, let's not go there. In, in these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. So in those days, there was a particular pool. So the pool, an angel will come and stir the pool. Of course, you could not see the angel. But everybody will wait by the pool. And once the pool is stirred, the first person that goes in, what happens to the person? The person gets healed, right? And so there was this man. Next verse. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Next verse. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity. How many years? 38 years. Next verse. Then Jesus saw him lying there and knew he already had been in that condition a long time. Of course, he must have had bed sores. He must have looked like someone who has not been able to lift himself for a while. Probably even smelling. He said to him, do you want... Now look at this question very well. Hello, everybody read. Look at it. Look at it. He says, do you want to be made well? That was the question that Jesus asked him. He says, do you want to be made well? Next verse. Look at this man's answer. Is a yes or no question. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water... You, did you pay anybody? He said, I have no man to put me into the pool. He didn't answer yes. He didn't answer no. That was, they didn't ask you, do you have somebody to put you into the pool? Because he was feeling entitled. At least, since I cannot walk, somebody should see me and put me into the pool. That's the attitude that many of us have. He says, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred. But while I'm, I'm coming, another steps down before me. Oga, we didn't ask you that one, no. 
you, do you want to be healed or not? He was feeling very, in my opinion, he was feeling entitled. Stop feeling entitled. Thank God. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Thank God. You, you wake up in the morning, you can breathe, everything is okay. Thank God. Just thank God. Some of us even go as far as speaking about people that are going through certain challenges and say, that one, hmm, maybe God don't sin against God. Now why son to the dwarf? But Jesus is merciful. Is merciful. He healed him. But how I knew that there was one high that Jesus was doing to look at this man. Eh? Should I show you the script, the, the, the verse? Yeah, there was a way Jesus was looking, and he gave him a very clear instruction. Can we go to next verse? Next verse, next verse. And immediately, immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Next verse. The Jews therefore said to him, Who was cured? It is the next verse, next verse. He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Next verse. Next verse. But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn. The must have been in that place. Next verse. Can you go to the part where, uh -huh, this is it. He said, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Oh God, you have been made well. Do what? Lest a worse thing come upon you. Somebody that is paralyzed, though. What kind of sin was he committing? I mean, it's not only me that is reading it. Sure you can see it. He said, oh God, see no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. This is the entitled man who, that felt like some, no, there's nobody to put me in the pool. He said, oh God, I just had mercy on you. If I look at the things that you are doing, I will walk past you. God is telling somebody today, you are breathing now, you are showing yourself, shutting up and down. No grief for anybody, no grief for anybody. I just had mercy upon you. Please, learn to be thankful. Learn to have gratitude. Don't feel too entitled. God does not owe you anything. Do you understand? Some, sometimes, yes, it's true. Oh, I'm a child of God, I'm a friend of God, whatever. Can we, can we look at God in the exact ratio that we should look at him in comparison to us? God is not your mate, oh. I don't know if you understand. Like, like, not your maids. Sometimes you need to, maybe, maybe one time, eh, we will come and all we will study is God. When we will talk about his, not just our experience, but we will talk about how the Bible describes him in the exact way. How he is hidden in light. Scripture does not just say light. It said unapproachable light. One who can send his presence, but yet he's in a different place. Do you understand? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, he can send, as you are now, you cannot send your presence anywhere. Worst case scenario, you call or you write a letter. But he can send his presence. Like, the power that, that is around him, he can send it somewhere. And so when you get it where you are, you say that the presence of the Lord is here. But it's in a different place, physically speaking. It's not your mate. Let's learn to, to be thankful to God. Are you hearing me? Are you getting what I'm saying? Whew. Practical steps to cultivate a culture of worship. The last one is corporate worship. Now, this is where what we do here uh, um, in church, this is, this is, it sums up the bulk of what we do right here. Corporate worship. While personal worship is vital, participating in corporate worship is essential for encouragement and unity. Can we look at Hebrews 10.25 quickly? Hebrews 10, 25. 
It says, not forsaking the what? The assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some. So he knows that some people have decided to forsake the coming together like we are now. So he says that, but exalting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So basically, what he's saying is, do not neglect corporate worship. When we come together, this is actually part of our Christian journey and requirement for the Christian race, coming together as a body. Do you understand? So when we come together, now let me tell you this. When I say come together, when we say corporate worship, we are talking about corporate worship both in your presence and in your behavior. Do you get what I'm saying? Some people have come together physically, but they have not necessarily come together. People are in church, but they are not in church. Ask your neighbor, are you in church? What corporate worship means is that when, if you, if you look at, I think it's First Chronicles chapter 5, I'm not sure. If you look at how the Bible describes or described the worship they had at the temple, it says that they were in one accord in such a way that even the way they stood, the things that they wore, different things, they were just in one accord. Unity, for it to be called corporate worship, there's got to be unity. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. When it's time to stand, guess what you do? You stand. When it's time to sit, guess what you do? You sit. It's not as if if you sit when others are standing, you will go to hell. No, that's not what it means. That's not what I'm trying to say. It does not mean that God will now hate you and start to beef you. When other people are standing, you will not stand at you. Come and ask me for something. No, that's not, that's, not, that's not what it means. That's not what I'm trying to say. God will still answer your prayers. You know, you will still make it in life in Jesus' name. But, but what I'm saying is that for it to be called corporate worship, there's got to be unity. Corporate means together. Are you following? So there's got to be unity. When it's time to pray, everybody prays. Not some people using their phones and some people doing other things. No. Corporate worship means corporate worship. Do you understand? Because you see, if you look through the Bible, God honors worship that is done corporately. There are certain experiences that will only come during corporate worship. I tell you that for a fact. If you read when the angel visited Zechariah, Scripture says that they were in one accord in the temple. If you look at when the Holy Spirit first introduced himself to the apostles, they were in the upper room in one accord. So corporate worship has always been one of the means why, where, where God uses to, to spur spiritual encounters and bring solution. Do you understand? So it's important. If you come to church, be in church. Can you imagine being a part of an army and then the commander say, everybody line up. You not just stand. Ah, that's the day I line up. The first day I line up. Today, my rest, my person rest, me no die. Man, man, shit. It's corporate worship. You have to be invested in the worship. It's important. It's important. God commands his blessings upon the people that serve him corporately. And then... I will just mention two hindrances to your worship. Number one, sin. If you look at Isaiah 59 verse 2, NLT. Isaiah 51, 59 verse 2, NLT. Are we there? What does it say? I want everybody to read it. One, two, three, go. So sin can be a barrier to worship. Are you getting me? Yes, sin can be a barrier to worship. So ensure that you live a holy life. Praise God. Number two, distractions. 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 Can we look from NIV? Luke chapter 10, verse 40 to 42. Luke 10, 40 to 42. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? 
tell her to help me. Next matter, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about how many things? Many things. You have come to church, and you thought about the food that you bought, you thought about the transportation, the food you will eat, you know. You are worried about many things, and so the Lord is shouting your name. Benga, Benga, you are worried about too many things. If you stop worrying about too many things. Joseph, stop worrying about too many things. Next verse. This is what he's saying to you. He said, but only one thing is needful, which means that keep the many things and be concerned about what? One thing. When you come before him, let there be just one thing on your mind. He said, Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her, which means many things can be taken away from you. But focus on one thing, which is your worship to your creator. You come before him, let your mind be there. See, Jesus said, come unto me, all you that are what? And in what? And I'll give you what? What many of us do when we come, we are not interested in the rest. We want to be interested in worrying so that we, we are so concerned about the worrying. So even sometimes you hear a sermon, you participate in worship, you drop it down. After the service, you go back to the altar, you carry it again and you go. He's the one that can give you rest. Stop worrying. Worrying does not change situations. Hello? It doesn't. So once you are with him, put away everything. It's like when you go to visit the president. For example, you're having a meeting with the president or anybody, any sensible person. And then they are talking to you or you're interacting with them and you're pressing your phone. I hope you know it's very rude. Did you know that? Even men, listen to me. You take a woman on a date and you are on the table, you are pressing your phone. <laughs> This David and the one in the Bible, they have something in common. Hello. <laughs> Praise God. You, you, you take your phone and you are pressing your phone. No. You put your phone on silent or do not disturb. And then you turn it down. Do you understand? And then you focus on the person that you are dealing with. Give them your full attention. Hello. Don't come to church and you are distracted about many things. You are pressing for. One day we were in church. I was just walking. By the, I saw somebody playing game on Facebook where he said people were praying, people were crying. He chose to play a game for Facebook. Hey. Thank God, God is merciful. If it was in those days, people would be leaving church. Hey. Put away distractions. Be focused. Be focused on God. Now, now, you see, let me tell you. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. Worrying about the situation in God's presence doesn't bring it before him. Doesn't make it more evident to him that you have a problem. So now you, have, you, you want God to know that there's a problem. So you come with a frowning face. Pray. So that God will say, ah, that guy is not praying. Let me ask him, what's wrong with you now? You know, worship me now. Now lie. That's not how it works. God is not a man. Do you understand? So, so, be, be in church when you are in church. Keep the things that are disturbing you aside. When you focus on God, God focuses on you. That's why scripture says that draw near to me and I will do what? And I will draw near to you. There is a kind of worship that you give God that it starts to, it starts to feel like there's something he needs to do for you. Do you understand? Let me tell you, there was a woman. The woman gave the prophet a, a place to stay. And then the prophet was enjoying this woman's um, hospitality. One day, the prophet could not rest. So he asked the woman, well, what can I do for you? Even the woman said, ah, not, you know. Meanwhile, she had a need. She said, not, you know. But the servant said, ah, since we came to this house, I've not heard the cry of a baby. And so the man said, ah, by this time next year, you will have a child. Now let me tell you, for God to honor that word, it means that that's how he operates. When you focus on him, he starts to look for something to do for you. That's why you could visit Solomon to say, ah, Solomon, what do you want? What do you want? Tell your neighbor, focus on God. Don't be distracted. All heads bowed, all eyes closed.